So here we are with Elizabeth Ricker, and we're going to talk all about neurohacking today. But even before we talk about neurohacking, I want to talk to you about scientific self-help, because this is a term that you bring up in your work and that is distinct from self-help. And so get us oriented around that, and then we can talk about how we can hack our own brains. Absolutely. So first off, thank you so much for having me on here. This is such fun. So scientific self-help is a category that I'm hoping will really catch on, uh, and it's more than just infusing science into the popular popularization of a self-help category. It's what it is, is you're bringing research-backed interventions and approaches, but you're also trying things out on yourself. So it's about running self-experiments. And what do I mean by a self-experiment? So we go through life and we see things that we think may be helpful. So we're all subjected to these endless listicles of 10 things to do before you wake up in the morning, <laughs> practically. And it seems impossible to do all of them, but somehow we're expected to do all of them. So what scientific self-help does is it says, start with the things that are actually research-backed, first of all. And then from there, there, you actually still have a pretty large set of topics to try. So use self-experiments, which I can go into more depth with, uh, but take a scientific approach to testing things on yourself. And so that could be as simple as before I go into a big meeting, I don't know whether it would be best for me to meditate or if it would be best for me to do some exercise. So why don't I go test that? Rather than just proceeding through life blindly, why don't I actually go gather some data and learn what works best for me? And the reason why this is so important is, yes, science is powerful and important, and yes, it's you know transformed our lives in many ways, but what, the more we learn about the brain, the more we're learning that our brains are incredibly, maddeningly, gloriously unique. And this is great because it makes us all feel special, but it's a challenge because it means that one-size-fits-all solutions are unlikely to actually work perfectly for each person. So to create personalization, you actually need to run self-experiments. And it's not as daunting as it sounds. You don't need a PhD to do it. You can actually just run what's called an A-B test. And web marketers run this all the time on websites. It's used in a variety of different industries. Really what it comes down to is you're saying, does this, does A work better for me or does B work better for me? And then you run this test a number of times and you know, you start off with an A and a B that are actually research backed, hopefully. Um, but really, scientific self help is at its essence use research backed approaches, but then learn how to test them on yourself. Become a self experimenter. Great. So there's two things that kind of rose to the surface uh, when you were speaking. That one that I I really liked uh, when I heard about it, and the other that I had some <laughs> concerns. Okay. Okay. Great. So the, the one that the one that I love is this personalization and customization, and what we know about, I mean, everything from therapy to nutrition to type of exercise. We're all out there trying to find the perfect thing that someone else says is the perfect thing. When really we have to look at the data on ourselves, like what what is the perfect thing for me, and that's going to be different from you. So scientific self help can help a lot with that. But I have to be honest with you, when I picked up your book, my first reaction was, oh no, another thing to do. <laughs> and as a working mom, I'm like, oh no, now I have to like do this. A I can't just like go for my run in the morning. I have to do the AB <laughs> test before and after run. And I have to say that that actually got a little bit debunked as I, okay. as I learned more about your work and what I actually found is that I'm, I'm already doing a lot of scientific self-help, but I can get a little bit more streamlined about it and that actually it becomes fun. It becomes interesting. It becomes sort of learning more about me and how to like, you know, I don't even want to use the word optimize, but really live in in a way that is like my my best self, my most you know flourishing version of me. That's less irritable towards my kids and more focused when I'm with a client. So, exactly. I will say for yeah. folks that feel a little bit like, oh no, another thing to do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's ways that this isn't necessarily that. That's yeah. Thank you so much for saying that, and I think that is exactly the yuck reaction that can occur when you hear this for the first time. We all feel so overwhelmed, especially during COVID, especially during all the changes that are occurring right now. We don't need yet one more thing to do. Um, 
I will say a couple of things on top of, you've already covered so many fantastic elements to this. Um, the approach that I'm describing is just 15 minutes a day. And I've been very, very careful about keeping it to just 15 minutes. So the exact protocol that I use is there's a two and a half minute test before you start, then there's a 10 minute intervention, and then there's a two and a half minute test at the end. So it's not as daunting as it sounds. Most of us have most of us have 15 minutes that we can spare at some point in the day. I'm also a mom. I completely get it. Uh, and my neurohacking has sort of changed and evolved through my parenthood journey. Um, but I will say that it, the importance of it has actually grown even larger um, now that I'm a parent. It's actually been more and more and more important to me as I've gone on. So I'm so grateful to it. Um, and honestly, I don't think I could have written the book while pregnant and then a new parent um, if not for neurohacking. So just put that out there. It is doable. <laughs> yeah. And, it, and it's motivating because you see you see something having a benefit for you and yes. then that motivates you to continue that thing. So a lot of, you know, my work is around behaviorism. I'm helping people change habits and maintain those habits. But when you don't have feedback around it being of benefit to you, then you kind of give up. So it, it can be helpful for motivation. But, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you do a really good job talking about neurodiversity and about this work is not about making you more neurotypical. That's not the goal of this yeah. work. Um, so I'd love to address that because obviously that's something that's on a lot of people's minds right now and something that is important in terms of also just sort of a, um, a concept to wrap our, our, my, our heads around. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, so just to kind of, for anyone who's not as familiar with what neurodiversity is, um, there's a lot of definitions floating around, but the, the idea is that uh, there's actually a lot of diversity neurologically uh, in the way that we all show up as humans. So just in the way that we have, in the same way that we have different colors of hair and eyes and skin, um, and we are all different shapes and sizes, um, we all actually have very unique brain wiring. And some people will cluster around um, certain characteristics when it comes to emotional um, the ways that they regulate their emotions or perhaps the way that their cognition works. Um, and so people have sort of grouped themselves and it's even become a little political. So there are groups of people who are, say, on the Asperger's spectrum or sorry, autism spectrum um, uh, or who are Asperger's as well, um, who really identify with saying, hey, this is not a disorder. Um, stop trying to say that we're different and bad. We're just different. It's not bad. In some cases, maybe it's actually good where these people are better at certain types of tasks than other people, right? And then there are also people, uh, say, who have been slapped with the label of ADHD. And their, their groups are saying, hey, okay, we're different, but it doesn't actually necessarily mean that it is worse. And there's sort of this, there's this uh, hunter-farmer hypothesis that has been put forth. It's very interesting as well. It says ADHD is kind of a throwback to, um, to more hunter gatherer as opposed to farmer types. And actually, it's interesting. If you look at um, EMTs and... Um, a lot of emergency type personnel, these people are overrepresented um, as having ADHD. And so it's thought that actually, when you look at what's biologically going on for people who have ADHD, they, um, they often uh, do show up a little bit differently biochemically in terms of their response to high threat and stress, where they may actually be calmer than the average person would be under those circumstances. So it may be adaptive. So the point here <laughs> overall is that neurodiversity is saying, hey, there's just a there's a lot going on. It doesn't mean that there's one right way to be as a human, and we should probably stop being so simplistic. Um, so, so where I come at this with neurohacking is I'm trying to say that neurohacking, the point of neurohacking is to make you a better version of yourself. It is not to make you a carbon copy of some mythical, perfect average of being. Um, and also, it would be a bit preposterous if everyone was trying to be average, right? Aren't we all trying to be better versions of ourselves? Like, it, the, the whole concept is a bit bizarre. So anyway, I, I'm very much against trying to turn everyone into some mythical, neurotypical thing. I'm really trying to say, whatever it is that you want to be, let's figure out practical tools to get you there. Um, and so it may very well be that someone comes out as um, uh, seemingly, you know, not very neurotypical. They're very atypical. Um, and if there are way, if there are aspects of that that are causing them grief in their life, that are making them um, not able to function, well, of course you should 
work on that, right? That That's probably your primary bottleneck. So for instance, if, uh, one of the very first steps, chapter six, I talk about debugging yourself. You should start with a mental health assessment. If you are struggling in your life and you're miserable, uh, this is not a neurodiversity question. This is a basic health functioning question. You should address your depression. You should address whatever the thing is that's making you miserable if it's not something that's helping you. I mean, it's it's funny because this can get complex. Like we, mm -hmm. we see examples of artists, for instance, who did really good work when they were depressed. And so they kind of hold on to their depression. You often see this with creatives where they have this push pull with what they think of as mental health. Um, so however you define it, I really leave it up to the individual. However you define it, these are just tools. Use the tools in the way that you think is best. And you absolutely do not have to become neurotypical. In fact, I really hope you don't because we, we need more diversity in the world. We, we have a lot of problems. We all need to solve them. Um, and it's going to take a lot of different kinds of brains to do that. Yeah. You know, in my disorganization, I think is a little bit linked to, to creativity and I kind of don't want to, you know, I kind of like that they hold hands, but it, sometimes yeah. the disorganization gets in the way of my creativity because I can't produce anything if I'm so disorganized, right? Exactly. Um, so know, that's where of, you get to choose. Yeah, you, get you get to, get choose, to choose, you know, yeah. you, you pick that as your bottleneck for a little while, you get it up to a level that you feel more comfortable with, and then you ease off. Like, I'll be honest with you, I'm right now, um, I'm starting another self-experiment. And I, I did sort of a New Year's resolution type, you know, life um, assessment. And I looked across all these different areas. And I, there are a number of areas where I was definitely lower I mean, on the lower end of what I consider to be success, like acceptable for me. And I looked at those numbers and I was like, I don't really care. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to work on that right now. I'm just choosing not to. So I instead decided to focus on areas that I'm actually already strong in because it was a, it was a very intentional decision that in this time in my life, this is more important. Um, and I will work on those things later. I've worked on them before. I'll work on them again later. So the point is you don't always have to be working on your bottlenecks. You can also just choose to ignore those for a bit or even celebrate your weaknesses if you want um, <laughs> and just focus on the the stronger area if that's what is right for you. In your work, you talk about sort of these four main areas around um, that, that we can neurohack, that we can work yes. on in terms of our learning and memory, our emotion regulation, uh, and our creativity. And I'd love for you to break down for us a little bit about why you chose those things. And then we can go into a little bit more detail of what, what are some things that we could be trying out on ourselves and how we'd even go about trying out this concept of scientific self-help. So I picked those four uh, because they seemed to both, each one of them seemed to both be a very high real world impact. In other words, having a demonstrated research backed impact on your daily functioning at work, in your relationships, and kind of generally when operating throughout your life. Uh, and we have, in some cases, decades of longitudinal data indicating the importance of these mental abilities in those areas. So what I mean by that is for individuals who are high in these mental abilities, they seem to do better on a number of metrics that people really care about in their lives. And for people who struggle in those areas, it does seem that they tend to do worse and that they um, also have outcomes that, that people generally don't enjoy. Uh, so that's that was the main thing. I wanted to have areas that have really significant mental impact. The reason, that seems obvious, right? But the reason why that's so important as a researcher is that, frankly, there are a lot of areas that uh, we cover in the research literature that are, to me, intellectually fascinating, but have not really been demonstrated to have so-called real-world significance. So that's why I wanted to find things that actually, you know, if you're doing, if you're going to spend 15 minutes of your day, I want to make sure you have a good, uh, a high a bang for your neurohacking buck, right? So that's the real world component. The other part is that there are things that we know seem to correlate strongly with long long term outcomes, but we don't necessarily have great data around being able to change them. So they seem a little bit more immutable. And there's some discussion as to whether um, they're fully changeable, but there's enough controversy that I didn't think it was worth going after those. And we can all think of things like that. I mean, obviously height or, um, <laughs> you know, past a certain age, um, barring, you know, something horrible happening like lo losing a leg. There's often, often ways to decrease your abilities in, in certain areas. But um, so I wanted to focus on things that were also improvable. So thanks to decades of recent research on neuroplasticity, uh, we have a lot of data that's indicating that these areas are changeable even into adulthood, even into older age. So that's those were the two 
relatively strict criteria that I was submitting, uh, that I was subjecting all of these areas to before I selected them. And then the other is that I wanted to know whether there were interventions that come from the randomized controlled trial um, literature that indicate that, okay, we know which interventions actually seem to help. There's a lot of things where you can see people can change, but we don't exactly know why they're changing. So I wanted it to be controllable by the individual. Uh, and then finally, these four in particular are interesting to me because they kind of span the gamut of what we think of as mental performance. So when you think of, you know, you meet a really smart person, you might be thinking, oh, that person has great attention. They have great memory. They have, you know, a mind like a steel trap that they can just never hold on to, uh, sorry, never lose a, a piece of information. But we also think of really creative individuals as being particularly brilliant or ad admirable or, or uh, contributing to areas. And then we also think of people who have sort of a Zen-like calm about them. And that's really impressive as well. So that's why I chose creativity, uh, emotional self-regulation, which is kind of what it sounds like. It's really the ability to detect your emotions, uh, to be that sort of self-aware, and then also to be able to change what you're doing going forward based on that self-awareness. So to kind of have that control um, uh, both internally and then be able to make good decisions uh, in your environment. And then the other two, learning and memory, are kind of what people typically think of when they think about, you know, oh, that's a smart person. Um, and then, yeah, so kind of bringing all of these together, you often will find people who are strong in one area, but they're a little weaker in another. And that is an exciting opportunity for neurohacking because it means that you can work on your strengths, but you also can target your bottlenecks. So in sum, <laughs> um, I chose these four areas because they're research-backed, uh, they're of real-world significance, and they are kind of interesting and diverse, and they give you a lot of options for your neurohacking. And they move beyond the sort of this traditional model of IQ that we're taught about in terms of smartness or grades that we're taught about, you know, in school and actually looking at so this, these ways of functioning that if, if I can find my bottlenecks, which actually I did. So you have all these oh, self-assessments in there, which is so fun. I did it on an airplane, did some of them on an airplane <laughs> while I had like a five hour flight. It's like, oh, I can do all these little self-assessments. Um, but, you know, it was interesting because even within one category, so for example, the category of executive functioning, I, I, um, I heard someone say once, it was actually Dan Siegel that said he has um, excessive attention disorder. <laughs> like he can, <laughs> he can talk on a topic for seven hours straight. I have that. Like I can, I, I, actually, I have that too. <laughs> I can attend for way too long and actually right. get into states of flow really quickly. Uh, so that's not my issue. But my issue within the executive functioning is organization and um, plan serial planning. So it was so yes. helpful to kind of do these little very quick. I mean, it didn't take that long. These little self assessments yeah. to then be able to look at. Okay, if that's an area that's important to me, planning and um, an organization, which yeah. kind of does show up. I will have to say, people that know me, I'm, <laughs> I like it's kind of disorganized working with sure. me. Uh, it, but it's something that I want to I want to work on and get better at, and I think I can. Um, yes, you can. And then the other arena was emotion regulation, which of course I love as a, as a psychologist that you're including that in yes. our um, looking at what is a healthy brain. And for me, actually, interestingly enough, my area that I struggle with is around my mood. And so mm. over the course of my whole life, I've been sort of in someone that struggled with anxiety and I've naturally turned towards interventions for myself to manage my anxiety. But okay, yeah. I'm using your model to get a little more fine-tuned. Like if I do my yoga at noon, yes. does it have a better impact on the rest of my afternoon with clients versus if I do it at the end of the day or I do it yes. in the morning? And exactly. that's where this kind of self-experimentation is super cool because you can, you may already know these things about yourself, but you can get a little bit more fine-tuned. What's also fun about, I, I love everything that you just said, and it's, it's so exciting to hear, to, for me to hear from a psychologist that you're, you see the tie into the emotional regulation and that you like the expansion of what is mental performance and what is a healthy, high operating brain. Because I, that was actually a, an eye opener for me. Um, I grew up in a very academic family and everything was very, very focused on sort of what I later learned was cognitive skills. 
And it didn't, it wasn't until I was much older that I began to realize that some of the areas where I was thinking I was having difficulty with attention, I actually discovered had to do with mood. I was yeah. like you struggling with some anxiety, um, and in some cases, low mood. And I didn't understand how that was impacting even my ability to learn and remember in school. Um, so one of the things that actually drew me into this work was I was very puzzled as a child with my own mental performance. And I had this very irregular pattern where I would sort of zone out in in class um, and I didn't understand why. And I would have brain fog and all these various issues. And it I, I mostly noticed because of the effect on my ability to pay attention and learn. But it wasn't until later that I understood some of the tie-ins with emotional self-regulation and kind of mood and how when you look at the brain, it's not a surprise because the limbic system, the hypothalamus, the executive function areas like in the prefrontal cortex, all these are so either right next to each other or very tightly wired. So there's it's it's no surprise that one, one area would affect another. They're just absolutely in an ecosystem. So um, anyway, thank you for saying that. It makes me happy that you that you see that tie-in and that is that that's meaningful to you too. Um, I'm curious also about the the timing effects that you discovered. So you mentioned that you're exploring the effect of yoga at midday versus the end of day. Have you tried it at the beginning of the day too? And I'm curious kind of how, like, what has that looked like for you and how are you finding the neurohacking helping inform it? Yeah. Well, I'm finding that as much as my schedule does not like it, <laughs> midday <laughs> is ideal, which actually means I have to practice some acceptance of I'm not going to book a client in that spot so that I right. can do some yoga. Yeah. Uh, because what I find is that when I, for me, when I take a break midday and do do something that's totally not cognitive and that is very mm -hmm. body-based right. and that is movement-based, so a lot of my work is sedentary as a, as a therapist. Of course. Yeah. And, um, so when I do something that's very, and very cognitive, right. Sure. But when I do something that's more body-based, it almost resets my system so I can go in and be more creative and present mm. and, mm -hmm. um, and, and sit with a client in the afternoon. I'm finding that to be more beneficial than at the end of the day for Interesting. me. Makes a lot of so, sense. Yep. Yeah. And then I don't do it at the beginning because I, in the beginning of my day is when I do, um, more of my high intensity interval training or running, or, um, also I do breath work in the morning and I, and I yes. find that that's really helpful. And that's just through my own, you know, over time, I've just sort of learned that I'm, I, if right. I say I'm going to exercise at four o'clock, I will not. <laughs> so I also, <laughs> which was, which, you know, you have so much information in your book around exercise. And mm -hmm. so let's talk a little bit about some of the, some of the interventions that you, sure. um, talk about, let's talk about them globally in terms of what you've seen in terms of these are effective interventions. And then, yeah. and then obviously it depends on the individual, right? Cause you're asking me for someone else, midday yoga is not their, th it's be, not going to be, it could be, yeah, it could be the opposite. Yeah. It could be the opposite. And it's, and what's so interesting too, is that these are very affected by people's circadian rhythms. So someone who is a stereotypical night owl, as opposed to sort of an early bird, it, their hormonal um, patterns throughout the day, their stress levels throughout the day, their alertness levels, they look, they look like different people because they're, they're very, they're categorically different. And so the best intervention for someone who is more of a night owl is going to be very different from someone who is a, a classic morning bird. So, um, and you're a night owl. I learned awesome. that about you and your, <laughs> so yeah. okay, this is a very interesting thing. So yeah. I was, I have been a night owl for a very long time. Now that I have a little one, I have been forced to wake up early and what's, it was very painful. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Um, but what's interesting is that I have been adapting to it and I am starting to, I don't know if I'm becoming an, an early morning person, but I am realizing that many of my early findings that I thought I could rely on, like, I know this is a good intervention for me at this time. I know this is a good intervention. Those things are changing. And so this mm -hmm. is actually, this is one of the interesting and fun things about neurohacking is that it's very dynamic. So you find truths about yourself that I would say are lowercase t. <laughs> and then they change and they're very useful for a while. And then you run another experiment and then you discover, okay, well, this has, has changed. This has shifted. I have a new bottleneck or I have new interventions that work for me and that's okay. It's kind of, it's a fun exploration. Yeah. It's a process, right? And it's it, a process that's, that's exactly <laughs> that it's not all about outcomes here. It's also about sort of being in sort of awareness of wherever you are in your development. Welcome to motherhood. It's just going to all yes. change again in about 
three months. So exactly. Yeah. And it's been fun because waking up in the morning to work out has, the reason I thought of it was that working, working out in the morning was never something that I was going to do. That was never a set of interventions that was going to be part of my regimen. And now it actually is. Um, and so I've, I've kind of unpacked this whole area that wasn't available before. Um, so that was kind of exciting. 